And today we are delighted to have John San Giovanni. John is a best-selling author and nationally recognized leader in mathematics education. He works as a mathematics coordinator in Howard County, County Maryland, and as an adjunct professor at McDaniel College. He also works as a national consultant, providing professional learning for content, pedagogy, and curriculum design. John is a frequent speaker at state and national conferences. He is active in professional organizations serving on the board of directors for both the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics and the National Council of Supervisors of Math Mathematics. Daily, daily Routines to Jumpstart Problem Solving is John's 15th book with Corwin and is the focus of today's webinar. And now please welcome John San Giovanni. All right, thanks, Erin, or excuse me. <laughs> thanks, Margaret. I got a text from somebody else. Hi, folks, I uh, hope you're having a great day. I just wanna say first and foremost, thanks for taking a moment out of your day to spend with me. I know that many of you are working with kiddos today, working with teachers, you're exhausted, um, but you're still here and you're taking a moment to learn about problem solving, hopefully get some new ideas to incorporate, in, incorporate into your work. And so I'm always honored to spend time with teachers leaders, et cetera. So thanks for that. My email address is on the screen. You're always welcome to send me a note. Twitter handle is there as well. I'm also watching the chat box. So I'll answer the questions as we go, if I can. And uh, yeah, a lot of my favorite places to visit on in that chat box. So hello there, especially Triangle, Virginia, but that's a conversation for another time. So let's just jump in, shall we? You're probably wondering about that cow, aren't you? I looked hard for that cow. I had to find just the right cow. So let's go ahead and do some math. Take a moment to uh, solve the problem that you see on the screen. You don't have to share your answers or anything like that. There are nine cows. How many eyes are there? Take a moment to uh, think about what that answer might be. Don't share anything just yet. All right, everybody has a solution. You're probably thinking, are you for real? Well, that might be. Now, if I was doing a really good job with this to, to kick off, I'd have you show your thinking. I mean, like, well, there's nine, nine times two is 18. Fair enough, fair enough. So some of you might be thinking like, well, I could draw the picture. Okay. Oh, I see some answers popping in there already. The answer was 14. I don't know what you were thinking, but it was wrong. Maybe not. Maybe not. Well, there were nine cows in the barn. And this student drew his picture, her picture, found 14. You're like, how is that possible? Well, as you can see, four of them are facing sideways. <laughs> you see the, there's five that are looking at you. They kind of look like snakes. Um, but we're not, you know. <laughs> and then four are facing a sideways profile, right? So. 10 eyes and four eyes makes 14. If you're thinking 18, well, maybe that's a right answer as well. But you're like, why are we going with this? As a classroom teacher, as a student of problem solving, as someone who's tried to develop thinkers and help kiddos think, especially the kiddos in my own house, right? I, we marvel at diverse insights, perspectives, strategies, and solutions, right? Well, look. Typically, there'd be 18 eyes. But this is an outside the box kind of thing. We kind of think it's interesting, right? Would you like to know that this was marked wrong? And I don't want to tell you about the story or the conversation I had to have with the parents afterwards. Not that I marked it wrong, but we often marvel at diverse insights. The question and conversation for tonight is how well do we nurture them? And that's not really about we, that's about me. Because as a teacher, I really wanted my kids to think, reason, but I didn't always go about it in that way. And that's one of our conversations for tonight, among many, many others. Monique, I saw in the chat box, the recording will be made available to all participants that are live tonight, as well as those who couldn't be with us and signed up. So what I want you to do before we get started is just to take a moment and jot down a challenge or two 
um, that you have as a teacher of problem solving, a challenge that students have with problem solving? If you support teachers who plan for problem solving, like what have you heard them say? Just jot down an idea. You can throw it in the chat box when you're ready. Patty is first in there, no prize tonight, but I like it, a lack of perseverance. Oh, and that kind of goes with Deborah's point about giving up before they start, right? Sometimes being able to read the problem, but I'd argue it's about the context and understanding the problem. Thinking critically can be hard. Understanding the words, but not necessarily just the words. Like, you, okay, now you're just destroying the chat box. How do you expect me to keep up with that? Fear, saw it. Oh, understanding the problem, right? Not having strategies. Comprehending and making sense of. <laughs> just using Google. Fair enough. Fair enough. Just plugging and plugging. I know that one, right? Oh, why do I even have to do this? Is this problem even worthwhile? Multi-step problems, Jennifer. A very good one. Okay, you all are just, you're killing it. Oh, prior knowledge. That's a nice one too. This idea that like, do I have problem prior knowledge? Not just about the math, but maybe the context, right? Only having one strategy. Okay, at this point, you're just, you don't have, you, you destroyed the chat box. Good job. And for those of you watching the recording, hopefully you can see the things that pop up, but there's so many different ideas, right? Sometimes being reliant on being intuitive, but not always. So I often do this with teachers to talk about like, what are the problems that we have? And I think about my own problems that I had teaching problem solving and working with kiddos um, as they problem solve, right? And I would argue that if we, you and I, if we wrote down the ideas in the chat box and started sorting them on sticky notes, they would fall into buckets, right? And the buckets that are on the screen are um, the ones that I find most familiar. I need you to hear me say like, this isn't the only collection of problems or, or challenges that we face as teachers and students, but think these are the mainstream ones, if you will. Understanding the meaning of a problem. What's going on in the problem? Making sense, comprehension. Skill association is one that I encountered. Maybe you're familiar with it. That's the idea that I've been working on addition for the past three weeks. So every word problem that I come across is automatically gonna be addition, right? And if I don't know what's going on, it must be subtraction. <laughs> Multiple step problems, right? because they don't follow clean, neat patterns. Something I like to call strategy palooza. Strategy palooza is this idea that I have so many strategies, I am almost incapable to grab one because I, I'm, I'm bouncing around in my head. Do I do this one? Does she want me to do that one? What do I do? Does my answer make sense? Does it make sense to add or to multiply? Right? What's happening in the problem? Perseverance is always a challenge and perseverance is a passion of mine, right? Because this is something that can be hard. And at every moment, somebody will start to give up, right? So finding a problem that's just right for students. Fear and anxiety, being overwhelmed, especially when there's a lot of words in a problem or the types of numbers. As a fourth grade student, I would see fractions and be like, what? Nope, can't do it. Or even how do I get started? right? Like those are some of the buckets that anything you put in the chat box often falls into. And, and my new book talks about these, these challenges, but, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Traditionally, we have used strategies in our classrooms, and I'm going to be the one to say, I have done them. And the answer is C, Deborah, that's exactly right, right? Traditional strategies to confront problem solving have often created more sheep than cows. Yeah, I know, I'm taking liberty with the animals here, but like sheep, we haven't even talked about sheep yet. I'll get to sheep in just a second, right? Now listen, we're gonna get into some stuff that I think is pretty cool and things I think you'll find really successful with your students. But first, I just wanna lay the foundation for things that haven't worked. And I wanna be clear, we know that these things don't work, but I also wanna say that I've done some of these things and I was frustrated when they didn't work right? Traditional approaches to problem solving often create more well, sheep than the cows. What's that mean? Well, we all know this famous problem. If you don't, I'll share it with you briefly. There are 25 sheep and five dogs in a flock. How old is the shepherd? Like, what the heck is going on there? If you're in second grade, you're like, I don't get it. Must be subtraction. 20. First grade, the answer is 30 all day long. You get to fourth grade and then you're like, oh, must be division because I don't, and then, right? I mean, we've all had that experience, or at least I bet many of us have. Well, as you probably also know, 
three out of four students will give an answer to this. And again, it's a famous problem, right? I'd like to, I don't want to share this. Sometimes my classrooms are above average if you catch my drift. I would actually give this the problem to my students at the beginning of the year just to see what they would do. But why? Why do they give an answer? Because our traditional approaches have done things like circle the numbers, do something with them. It's math. Highlight the important information. Truth be told, I would have kids like highlight the entire word problem. Label your answer. I don't know what you're talking about, right? Like these are the things that we've all done and it doesn't make us bad people, right? But it hasn't got the results we wanted because it wasn't really thinking. But wait, there's more. You know, keyword strategies are approaches that we've used in the past as well. And I know there's beautiful anchor charts out there with keywords on them that tell you what to do. You take a look at that first problem about the clown getting, well, okay, clown, so it's already scary. I'm not persevering, I quit. Altogether, typically tells you to add. But in that problem, you need to subtract. I don't know some of you are thinking, oh, yeah, well, you could just add the unknown. Yeah, sure, you could. You can do that. No first grader or six-year-old does that, but you could. Times. In the bottom problem, times means to multiply, but in that problem, you actually need to divide. Listen, we're going to get to some good stuff in a minute, but I just want to set the context. Traditional approaches to problem solving just don't work. One of my favorite problems. This is my own problem. 13 coats are left on the playground and 25 coats are left on the playground. How many coats are left on the playground? The word left means to subtract, but in this situation, we're joining the groups that were left, right? In fact, most students, when you pause this or share this problem, will add, or I'm kidding, they'll subtract. In fact, even more kiddos will subtract in this situation if I put the larger number, 25, in front of the smaller number. Yeah, right, Cheryl, it's a very, very common problem, yes? And there's some more. I don't want to linger, but again, we're talking about how do I get more cows, right? Kids who think and reason, who may not get the number that we want them to get, but who can make sense of the math they're doing. And just to be clear, there's other things beyond that, okay? There's other things beyond that. Historically, to factor out thinking, we proceduralize things like problem solving. You're very familiar with cubes, or maybe you are, but some type of like acronym for how do you solve a problem? In fact, colleagues, Lisa Andrews and Beth Cobet, they explored classrooms and looked at different posters of keywords, and they found some of these different ones. Take a look, cubes, super, fuse, Q-tips. That one's pretty gross. Nice. But if you look, the letters mean something different in each one. And now double down. If you're in first grade learning cubes, and then you go to second grade, you learn about super. And then you go to fifth grade and you learn about Q-tips. It's really a fragmented approach to learning and thinking. It, it does make problem solving hard. Yeah, you're right, Melissa. This isn't part of the math pact work, right? Having whole group, whole group agreements and such. But there's more. You know I'm going to share more. The way that we've homogenized mathematics and leveraged mimicry as a way of teaching math and not focusing on kiddos and their strengths. Kids can draw pictures, kids can make sense. Tracy, I can't go back yet, but I'll make sure you have the recording, okay? <laughs> and there was a time when we taught problem solving Fridays, right? We isolated problem solving and maybe insinuated the kiddos that problem solving is not something that you actually do in math. Math is with numbers and problem solving is something different. All right, this is the boring part of the night, but I just had to lift this part up because what's missing from our traditional strategies? The one thing that's missing from the approach that I've used from time to time is just that, Chrissy, thinking. Making true understanding. doesn't matter what you put in the chat box, but Jill has got the right answer. Okay, Jennifer, so do you. All right, Arlene, so do you. That's enough. But thinking. 
What might I, what might happen next? How can I show this? Do I even need a picture? What's this about? What's the question? Hmm, what does this remind me of? What would be the outcome? Right? And there's many more parts to this giant Venn diagram, if you will. Right, this diagram, like thinking has so many different components to it. And my new work is about how do we help kids practice thinking? Like, and not like thinking with no parameters or with no guidance or guardrails. Like, how do we help them focus in on just question asking or sometimes just how problems are similar and different or sometimes just what would that problem look like? Or maybe sometimes what is the equation that I would use? It depends on what their needs are, right? So as we dig in for the next collection of activities and such, again, I was setting up the evening. My new work really focused on this idea that we want students to think. We have to develop, of course, their conceptual understanding and understanding of context. But this takes time. Any curriculum that has word problems set for two weeks isn't doing it right. As a teacher and as a student, I need opportunities to tinker with my thinking. I need to hear how other people think and disagree with them. Maybe agree with them. And I need to practice this, not at the end of the page or as the harder problems if I got done early, but instead, I need to find a way to practice my quick bursts almost every day. If you're familiar with my work around number routines or other people's work around number two routines and number talks, this is essentially what a word problem could look like with number talks. We're not going to really talk about answers too much tonight, right? I'm going to give you a flavor of some of the things you can take and use with your students or the teachers that you work with. And I'm going to highlight them in a couple of different ways. These are, well, all routines. Routines that I could do with the word. Oh, yeah, routinely. All right. Well, it's the best joke I got on a Monday afternoon. So this first routine is called same and different. This is a routine to compare and contrast problems because one of the ways that we make sense of the world around us is by thinking about how is this the same and how is this different? So let me, um, let's get started. One of the first things that I've written about and I've learned to do is like, what do you notice and wonder? And we're all very familiar with notice and wonder, right? We'll talk a little bit more about notice and wonder at the end of the day for a time together. But I learned recently working with adults that adults who could read don't always understand the problem either. In fact, a friend who doesn't have a dog was doing this next problem and it reminded me that pictures help get us started. Yeah, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Puppies, yes. Are we getting puppies? No, no puppies today. I like puppies, me too. I have a puppy. Oh, really? My mom's never going to get rid of it. Um, I don't want to hear about that right now. Our puppy, okay, stop for a second. What's inside the puppy stuff? Those are treats. How do they get them? And like, I need to have that conversation with kiddos before I do that word problem because my 42 years of experience compared to their five years of experience well, on this planet, might be in different places. I go back to my friend who didn't have a dog. So the idea of like treats inside a toy, she's like, what are you talking about? I don't even know how to draw that. So anyhow, I start like this. And the new resource gives you pictures. You can find pictures anywhere, as you know, Google images, yada, yada, yada. But here's what I want you to do. Take a moment to read the problem and just think about what's going on. So in the classroom, how this would work is I would pose a problem. One of the things that I encourage in, in the work is to let students try to read it first on their own. Even if they can't read it, just, just try. I'm not going to dictate to you. I'm not going to read to you right away. Then they're going to talk about, like, what do you know about the problem? What are you trying to find out? What could your equations look like? What's your picture look like? What's something you know about the problem, right? Talk with a partner. And so students would turn and talk. They might have questions like Renee says, like, were there other treats in there? Oh, because sometimes I assume kids can't solve problems because they can't do math. But sometimes gumming up the works is, well, were there more treats in there already? Right? 
And so like, I need that stuff to kind of pop. I need that stuff to kind of like bubble out, right? No, that's all the information. It was empty before. Oh, okay. So kiddos have had a chance to turn and talk. I've had them a little brief conversation about it. I might turn back to them and say, all right, could you um, talk with a partner what your equation might look like, for example, right? And then I could record their equations. And right now you're like, so what's so special about this? Kind of a valid question. The equation that I heard us say was 32 minus 20. Why does that one make sense? Why were you subtracting? Because the puppy eaten them. Yep, he did. But Sam didn't. Oh, okay. I don't know. We could talk about it in some way like that. Does that make sense? So we're going to talk about that first problem for a few moments. I'm not going to draw pictures or anything, though I might need to in the classroom. And if you teach sixth grade or something, don't worry. I got an example for you in just a moment. But before I go there, that's not the whole routine. After I do that, I put up a new problem. Take a moment to read the second problem. Nineteen, twelve, forty-seven. Shut up. Okay, not something I'm going to say to my kids. I'm just going to take it. Turn and talk with a partner. How is the second problem like the first problem? How are they different? Kind of like problem strings, potentially, Melissa. I mean, there's a lot of different options here, right? Well, they're the same because Sam had treats in both and the dog ate them. Yes. What else do you notice about them? Well, they both have 32. That's correct. They both do have 32. The dog didn't eat as many on the second one. Oh, no, they didn't. No. So what do you think that would do with our answer? It'd be different. Yep, I agree. What do you think it would do with the equation? It'd be different, too. What about the equation? It would be the same. 32? I don't know. I'm making this up on the fly, as you might imagine. But you can imagine what the discourse might be like, right? And maybe that problem is too wordy for kiddos at certain grades. Like we have to think about the wording and, and such. I know that, right? But we also can focus on how they're similar questions and what have you. What do you think your equation could look like this time, right? Oh, Renee, that's a good question. Would the answer be more or less than the first problem, right? This is where I empower and believe in our teachers to ask like good questions, right? I can't write the 37 questions you're supposed to ask. Some of this is touch and feel, responsiveness. And then I might reveal the second, the second um, equation, okay? Now, you might be thinking, okay, that's great, but I teach different grades. Okay, well, fine. I'll show you a different example then, smarty pants. Take a moment to read the second pro this new problem, the blue one. So a dog toy holds 32 ounces of treats and the box can fill that toy four times. How many ounces of treats are in that box? Go ahead and take a work, work on that for a few moments. Oh, Patty, I like that's a good thought there too. Go ahead and work on that for a few moments. So historically I've been critical of my kiddos to get like, oh, they just jumped to an answer. Right, because that's what we've honored. We said you get the answer fast, you're better. Depending on the numbers inside the problem, when you see 32 and four, you can't help but think eight, especially if you have some experience with factory call, right? In this situation, we would turn and talk again. It's in a different grade level, right? Same kind of questions. What's your picture look like? What's your equation look like? You don't always have to record the equation in this routine. I'm doing it intentionally for another reason. And then in this problem, I'm gonna pose a different problem and give you just a moment to read that and think about how those two are the same and how they are different in terms of the problems. Now, in this situation, we have a totally different conversation going on, right? The first time, I essentially gave you two problems that were identical, and I just changed the numbers. But in this routine, I could actually change, I could keep the numbers the same, 32 and 4, but ask a totally different question, 
The first problem, there were 32 ounces of treats and it could fill the box four times. Or the toy held 32 ounces in the box, right? Filled it four times, so that box held 128. Oh, thanks, Veronica and Lawrence. I appreciate those things. Acting those out is a good idea as well, Joan, and we need to lift up some of the ways that kids might go about that. But in the second problem, I'd ask a different question now. So the first problem, I was multiplying because I was trying to figure out how many times it would fill up the toy. And here, it's a different question. So it would have a different equation, as you know. <clears throat> I may not always get to that equation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but you get the idea, right? And before I give you the last example, we're going to jump into some other routines, trying to give you a taste of what this new work is about. Some of the things that we can do as teachers to help our kids think. Because that is the one thing problem solvers do well. They think. Okay, Lucy, that middle sentence is rough. <laughs> That's not the best example. I get it, but how do we help them think? Right? When you think about reading, like teaching kids the basic skills of reading is one thing. Teaching kids comprehension is something totally different and way harder. If you've ever had to teach two-step problems, it is one of the top five things as elementary and middle school teachers that we want to rethink our careers over. Regrouping with zeros and subtraction, like I was like, I quit, right? <laughs> Finding equivalent fractions, um, I quit. Long division, I'm quitting. Two-step problems, this is impossible. Check it out. I won't spend too much more time with this one because I'm going to get you some other examples. If you're listening to the recording, feel free to pause and come back and solve the problems first. Think about the question you've asked your kids. So Sam put 32 treats in her dog's toy. The puppy ate half the treats. How many treats were left in the toy? And again, you can imagine the turn and talk, the, the conversations. I'm not going through that every time, right? By the way, Andrew, that's a nice point. And Jennifer, you as well. I can't hit everything in the chat box. I apologize. Right. I might grab an equation again, might not. I would definitely want to talk about like, what does that picture look like? How would I label that? What's that visual? All those good things, right? And you might be thinking right now, like, okay, we're done. Move on. Fair enough. But let me just show you one more thing. Sam put 32 treats in their dog's toy. The puppy ate half the treats. Then Sam put 10 more in. Now how many are in the toy? I learned in my classroom, this is an awesome way to introduce two-step problems. We would get good with one step and be like, yeah, but how is this the same and different? It's the same because they ate half the treats. That's right. It's the same because they put 32 in. Yeah, that's right too. But it's different because then she put 10 more in afterwards. Oh. Now, again, I'm trying to keep us in, you know, middle or like middle elementary, upper elementary examples. If you call her outside of those lines in kinder first grade. Seventh grade, it still works. Oh, Allison, it's also the same question, right? No, oh, that's a good one, John. Yeah, I agree. So now I have two different equations, right? The first one from the first problem, but now I have to add to that. So I won't linger. This is one of the routines that I write about in my new work. It's one that you could take and run with right now without me or without the book. Pose a problem and then you change something about that problem, the numbers, the context, the question, another step, whatever it might be, and you pose a new problem. And instead of focusing on the solution, the conversation is on how those problems are similar and how they're different, how your solution path is the same and how it's different. And Deborah, you just put a great point in there. It's the conversation that develops problem solving. It's never been the solution. Hey, just real quickly before we go, I was trying this with some kiddos a couple months ago. I do work with students almost every day, or at least I'm in schools almost every day. Nonetheless, I had a teacher friend do this one. They're the exact same problem. Kiddos knocked the first one out of the park, killed it. And then we changed the context on the right side. And they're like, I don't get it. I can't have nuts. Well, then you definitely shouldn't buy the ones with nuts. Like, is this the same problem? Wait, couldn't I just subtract this time? 
So that's another way to go about it. The directions for this routine, one of 20, uh, in that new work is on the screen right there. I'm going to go forward. You can pause it and come back. But the question is, how do we get kiddos thinking as opposed to only getting answers? I will tell you this. Answers do matter. I know that. Thinkers do a better job of getting answers than kids who follow steps that they don't understand or mimic ways that an older person does it. Just saying. All right, ready for a new one? So two-step problems can be fun <laughs> or not. And I understand that kindergarten and first grade teachers, you don't necessarily teach two-step problems. That's okay, though. This thing could still work for you. I'll talk about it in a second. But first, here's how this routine and then works. It's a different one. It's not about comparing and contrasting, but instead... There's my picture again. So this might be a fourth or a fifth grade problem, could be a sixth grade problem for that matter at the beginning of the year. So I'm gonna have small groups of partners, you know, talk about the problem. What are they doing to solve the problem? Cat, most kiddos do struggle with two-step problems, but we can help them. So we talk about how to solve this problem, right? And we would play with it. I would actually solve it and say, okay, so we come to a conclusion, yep, there's 300 and oh, 360. How do you know? Blah, blah, blah. You get the idea what the conversation is like. We're only together for an hour, so I can't linger too long on the things I would lift up in that conversation, okay? So after I pose the problem, talk about it a little bit, then I do this. Okay, so the cupcakes, the school bought 360 cupcakes. And then, and then what happened? Like, what the heck are you talking about? Well, I had to train my kids on a routine like any of them, right? So when I pose an and then, then kiddos come up with a second statement. They can turn and talk with a partner. They can write down their own. They can write them on index cards. I could grab them. We could pick somebody to share for the day. And then half of them melted. Oh, no. And then I dropped 10 of them. And then I ate all of them except for six. And then, like, it doesn't matter. They can say whatever the heck they want. They can get silly. It's okay to have fun in math, right? And then, and then, and then, and then. Right? They get to shout out a bunch of and thens. Like, parents donated six more cupcakes, six more packs. And Sam's dog smashed half of them. Did he eat them? Yeah, some of them. Were they chocolate? Because that makes dogs sick. It does. You're right. Can we get back to the problem now? And then half of them were eaten. And then 36 cups were, cupcakes were set aside. I don't know, right? You weren't thinking. Oh, reminds me of back the lines. I don't know that one. Anyhow, and then, and then, and then, right? There's a lot of different ways to go about this. Like I might have kiddos share a couple. I might cherry pick the one I like the best, right? I might lift up my own. And one of the things that I wanted to write about was that we can't just imagine kids that can just do this without any problems, right? We have to help kiddos like learn how a routine works and we can use these as an instructional opportunity. Yeah, Jennifer, it's one way for them to take the lead in math. It allows us to help them not just promote agency, but bring their identities in the math class, right? Not just to be creative, but, but to take ownership. Yeah, those are good points all around. To teach this routine, I might pose a one-step problem, have them talk about it, then have them generate some and thens, and then spotlight some of the examples. Another way I might teach it is we all would solve the first problem together, and then around the classroom, I'd have a bunch of stations, right? And they might go to solve the problems at the different stations, and we'd come back and talk about how the different problems had different answers, even though they had the same start. Yeah, working with a partner, Renee, is very nice. Make I saw that. <clears throat> sure, you, yes, you do. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Hey, so um, check this out. Um, I don't know why the next slide's there, so pretend you don't see that. There we go. So, and then um, is, again, one of the routines I'm going to lift up tonight. We only have about 20 minutes. We only have that. About 15 minutes left, so I can get through maybe one or two more of the routines that are spotlighted in the work. But you're like, I teach first grade. How does that even work? And that wouldn't work. Yeah. 
what you can do with students in first grade, there are 24 cupcakes in the party pack. And then, and then Sam's dog ate six of them. Oh yeah, that works. No worries, Don. And then Sam's dog ate 12 of them. Oh, okay. And then Sam's dog, could anybody write a problem without Sam's dog? Then Aaron's dog, nope, let's not use dogs today, okay? Proof that I've clearly worked with kiddos. All right, so if you don't like those, it's totally fine. A couple of other routines I'm going to spotlight in our time together. Um, here's the first. This is called What's the Question? And it's a routine for well going deeper with questions. Now, I do want to say that when you work, I wanted to help kids think about all the different types of questions they could ask. And that alone is overwhelming for students. How many questions can I ask? What's the right question to ask? What question does she want me to ask? There's a routine for that, but that's not what I'm doing tonight. Instead, I'm doing what's the question well, in a different way. This is called what's the question version one. You're like, well, it's version two. It's way better. You'd love it. But I'm not doing that one tonight. All right. So a goose flies 40 miles in a day. What's the question? Write down a question you could ask. Oh, Angie, that's a good point. Angie, that's actually the second routine in the book. Not one I'm lifting up today, but like trying to quest, like what question am I supposed to ask myself to get started? So a goose flies 40 miles in a day. What's a question you could ask? How far does it go in 40 days? How fast is it going? Did it fly the whole time? How many miles in a month? That's a good question, right? How far is it going to half a day? What's a goose? Really good question. That's what that is on the screen. Who's chasing her? I do like a clever, funny, witty kiddo in my classroom. I usually have them take notes to the nurse for me. So, Andrew, if you want to leave now. <laughs> but, hey, so you write a question you could ask, and they share out some of those different kinds of questions, right? Have them compare questions with a partner, because some of the questions that you put on the screen are similar. How far does it go in two days? How far does it go in eight days? Same damn question. Whoops. Same darn question. <laughs> it's the same question, just a couple different days. How fast was it flying? Like, there are different questions they could ask, right? So they jot down a question. They talk with a partner about the questions that they came up with. And then as a teacher, I'm going to reveal my question. And again, I could start to talk about, like, how I was my question like yours. How's my question different? What would you have to do to solve my problem versus yours? Now, I just came up with the goose flies on, on the fly. That's a bad joke. No pun wasn't intended that time. But nonetheless, a goose flies 40 miles in a day. How many? Well, that, that was just one example, right? And in the interest of time, I don't want to lift up a bunch of others. But you can imagine, like, I just pose a starter. Get us think about what the different questions might be. They might write some darn good questions, and I'm going to grab them. I'm going to use them again later. They might come up with some lots of great questions, like some of you in the chat box. <laughs> See what I did there? Anyhow, because we have to have another conversation, which is the next routine. Is it always a question? My kid has assumed that they were. We'll get there in a moment. It doesn't seem like a really extensive routine. I do want you to know that obviously I've written a lot of different <clears throat> versions of this. And there's different ways that as a teacher, I could start to build off of that. I used to complain my kids don't read the question. And what I did recognize is they learned they didn't have to. Grab the numbers and do something. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? And just because there's a question mark there, how do you just made my day? Melissa? Are you talking about my jokes or Patty's statement? Probably Patty's statement is my guess. Man, if you're watching the recording, you're missing some brilliant statements in the chat box. All right, check it out. <clears throat> uh, we have time for, oh, what the heck, two more routines and I'm going to wrap up, okay? All right, so here's the first one. Sometimes kids don't read the question. Sometimes they're not sure about the question. Like, there's a lot of, like, I have to make sense of the actual question. So this routine is called Asked and Answered. 
And it's actually building towards a 21st century skill. Can that data really tell me that? Because I know I've seen in the news sometimes that data tells me stuff that probably isn't true, right? Or in advertising claims. So here's how this works. First, I'm gonna pose some data like you see on the table or in the table. Oh, you see the picture in the upper right-hand corner? I'm gonna start with that, of course. Are we having donuts? No, I like donuts, me too. There's sprinkles, yup. Those are rainbow sprinkles. Mm -hmm. What's the pink one called? Right, I need to get all that out. Hey, there are 12 in there. Nope. Is that coconut? Probably. And though sometimes it's frustrating when kids do that, like, I just want to teach math. Like, that's actually them telling me, like, I'm into this. I think you're being a silly nine-year-old, but you might not be. And nonetheless, data on the screen, you see it, right? And so how this routine works is totally different than others. Check it out. One way to go about it is, what is a question that you could ask and answer from the data? How many more boxes were sold on Thursday than on Wednesday? You could ask that one, correct? And you can answer it. So they could write up a couple of different questions based on that. But the other thing that I'm gonna do, what's a question you could not answer from that? How many more were sold on Tuesday than on Monday? That's right, why? Because you don't, you don't have no Monday on there. Exactly. <clears throat> like I have to be critical of the data I'm pulling out of a problem and what am I gonna do with it? So there's a bunch of ways to go about this routine. I wanted to give you an idea of how some of these are like, give you opportunities to go off in lots of different directions. And I thought this was a good one to do that with. Keep in mind, again, I'm trying to keep the math in a place where all of us can access it. I know some of us teach middle school and some of us teach first grade. And so therefore it's important just to kind of keep in some clean, just wrap your head around the ideas, okay? So if you're like, where are the linear equations? I'm gonna say not right now. But check it out. The other version of this routine is where I pose data and I put four questions up or two questions up or three questions up. And I have them determine which ones. So it's easy for them to generate something that can or can't be answered. But I want them to start being like, I want them to start thinking about the questions. You can't do A, Mr. S, why not? Because there isn't a Monday, fair enough. Can I give you four donuts on Wednesday? How many were left? 17. I got you, Lord. Oh, was it talking about single boxes or is it talking about single donuts? And by the way, I don't want to have that fight with kids. I want them to have the fight with each other. Right? No, you can't do that because it's not talking about donuts. It's talking about boxes. Oh. I want them to be like close readers, but I don't want to be the one telling them to go back and read it again, go back and read it again, go back and read it again. But that doesn't happen unless they have that experience of conversation with one another. Yes, Sandra, I, I think it is in low floor, high ceiling in lots of ways. In upper grades, mine, I have to work with four digit numbers here. Uh, Alexis, you're exactly right. It's all connected, well said. So again, you get the idea. I might start again with one, maybe two examples and then start to go up to more or give students a choice. By the way, I write about this, giving kids a choice, like choose one that you know you can answer and just one that you know you can't, right? You don't have to read all four. Jay, John, where do you get all the questions from? Well, obviously I provided you some examples, but I used to have kids write them and then I would cherry pick them, let them do the work. And I understand that I didn't lift up all of the middle school examples uh, for everybody, but I just wanted to show you like, yeah, of course it works with fractions, right? Of course it works with integers. Of course it works with all sorts of things. I mean, data literacy is obviously an important part of a 21st century citizen, let alone learner. Like what questions can I ask? What can't I ask? I mean, that's kind of part of this conversation, right?
again, that's a quick, brief example of that routine and some others. You know, Patty, that's a great takeaway. I'm glad you, right? Teaching math is teaching math, no matter how tall or short they are. No matter how old or experienced they are, good math pedagogy transcends grades. So in our time together, that's coming to a close, I do want to lift up a couple of other things that I lift up in the work, of course. Before I do that, okay, one last, I'm giving away the whole book. I'm not, because there's like spin-offs for all of these. And that's something I want to encourage you and the listener to, if you're listening to the recording to do. If you start to play the routine, you're like, that's not working right for me. You need to modify and change it to go after what you needed to go after. And so something that was important to me was to create modifications and things you might do to lift up different ideas. So <clears throat> last one, we all know that writing an equation is really important. This is a simple routine where I pose a problem, where you pose a problem. Oh, I like that. So you pose a problem, kiddos read it, maybe you read it all together after they've had a chance to read it first. And then they all jot down their own equation. And you don't have to give an answer. You can even write 36 plus 28 equals question, right? I don't want you to, like, I don't need your answer. Just tell me what it looks like. What's your equation look like, right? And then kiddos would then share out a couple. I record a couple. And then we'd have arguments about which ones you like. Now, just to be clear, that's the later version of this routine. The original version that you can read more about is where I pose two or three different equations and students argue about A, B, C, or D being the one that matches. And you have to listen for arguments like, well, it says left, so they must be subtracted. No, not subtraction. It must be subtraction because the bigger number goes first. That's not why we subtract. Does that make sense? In fact, in going after it in this ways, like, look, I've already put the solutions in there. You don't have to calculate, just think. It's a new concept in math where you think. <laughs> just plain, right? Oh, Margaret, you put up a big point. It's not just Ohio, it's other states, including my own here in Maryland. I see you Maryland people, right? Thinking and modeling problems is such an important part of math that we now are figuring out ways to include it on tests. Not to say this is about gaining a test, don't hear me say that. I'm gonna manipulate, I'm gonna put things up there that might be, I might, there might be more than one right answer on the screen, or there might only be one. Repeat this, you could do that first, can you? Julie, I'm glad you caught on to that, right? And I didn't think, I, I didn't do a good job lifting it up tonight. But like, this is a safe way to have conversations about word problems. I'm not all by myself. And to Melissa's point, like, they don't always understand that the equation is supposed to match the problem, let alone that it does, right? That's a great, great point. And so other examples of this, right? I can introduce unknowns in these ways. As I get into middle school, like this is where I might have, you know, different types of equations and obviously different types of numbers. And lastly, I could even do two-step problems with this, not through one equation, but through equation strings. Yeah, Lena, I like that as well. That was a really nice point about the this being a safe place to have conversations, right? All things being said, as you know, the directions where this will be included. I went through these routines really quickly, but I wanted you to get a taste of what we could do instead of some of the questionable things we've done historically. And by the way, I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. I'm saying I've done it too. Until I realized that's not what I wanted for my kids. So before we wrap up tonight, I also want to lift up one other thing that I think is valuable. You might disagree. And if so, you could just log off. <laughs> well, if you're listening to recording, you just quit, I guess. Give me a second to advance some slides, okay? So 
if you just want to close your eyes, you're like, what are we missing? What are we missing? It's nothing good. You wouldn't even like it. Okay. There we go. By the way, I agree with everything you're saying in there. And Mindy, your student always asks what if. And sometimes it can be frustrating as a teacher. But every kid, we want every kid to be that, right? All right, so hey, listen, one of the things that's baked into the work are some of my own personal soapboxes because I'm just that kind of person. No, I'm teasing, right? But some things that I think are important to think about, things I share with our teachers when I can. One of them is like, notice and wonder is awesome. I'm a fan of the idea. Annie and others who came up with it are friends. But noticing and wondering isn't problem solving. It's like the beginning of. And one of the things that I struggled with is that kids notice and wonder, but not the stuff I need. So throughout the book, there's some work like this, right? What do you notice? What do you wonder? And after they have some time to talk about that, then I need to ask something specifically. Where have you seen these before? Who sells those? Why are they sold? What's inside? How big are the boxes? Look, I'm going to let you say whatever you want first. But if I overlook some of this important information in the green, you might then have a problem drawing a picture. Right? Why do they call them dosy dos? That's a great thing. I wonder that too. I don't know. <laughs> they do look pretty good right now. Why make it smaller? Let's call it economics. You'll learn about that later. But I also need you to know there's more that I wrote, not just like notice and wonder, but did you notice in all the problems tonight there were pictures? So in the new jumpstart, there's pictures with every word problem. Obviously, you can find pictures on your own. But one of the best ways to help kids make sense of problems is to like think about the context. You know, we do that in reading all the time. What do you know about this? Where have you seen a dog before? Like, you get the idea. And in math, sometimes we don't do that because i got to get through this whole thing or I'm not going to do a good job today. And Melissa Campbell, yes. The real thing, not clip art, right? I mean, okay, listen, clip art's awesome and all from 1994, but like a real picture helps kids in other ways. It activates their prior knowledge. And one of the tips I offer in the book is if you can't find the exact problem or the exact picture, like do you see the cupcakes on the left hand side? Grab the picture and write the problem around the picture. Make sure you have a, well, you get the idea, right? Hey, and there's other tips in there that I can't spend a lot of time on tonight, but I hope you'll dig in and find out. Feel free to ask me questions about them. The first and one of the things we can certainly do is just play games like you see on the screen because those aren't word problems, but they have all the skills we apply to word problems. I took a swipe at graduate release at the beginning of the session. I'll just say it again, right? Problem solving is something kids need to do first because thinking is not something you can mimic. Now you need to hear me say this. After they've had a chance, I might need to explicitly teach the problem later, which is not first. I don't know what the prime client game is, going to Google that next, Joan. And last but not least, do you see the third bullet, no answer days? Sometimes kiddos are so fast to give an answer, they don't even think. And so sometimes in my math class, and maybe it's something you think about too, it's just every random once in a while, we would have no answer days. And my kids would get all jazzed with like, what's a no answer day? A no answer day was, you could do anything in math today, but we can't talk about the answer. I mean, they only happened once every like 10 or 12 days. But the point was, we're just going to talk about doing math today, not the final solution. So look, everybody here has had a long day on the East Coast. It's like almost time for bed. On the West Coast, it's almost time for dinner. If you're anywhere else, it's time for bed, really. <laughs> Alaska time. Well, it's just like 4 o'clock. You need to go to, well, anyhow. So listen, I want to just say thank you for spending some time with me. I want to lift up some ideas, right? 
I hope you all have a good rest of your school year. And before we leave, oh, you're all put the thanks in because you want to check out now. Don't pack up your bags just yet. Think about an idea that resonates with you. If you're leaving already, that's fine, right? Think about things that resonate with you. My email address is on the screen. Twitter's up there as well. Before we get out of here, Margaret's going to jump back on and tell you who the winner is. Yes. Um, thank you, John. Those were great examples and offered new ways of thinking about problem solving. So thank you all for joining us tonight and a big thank you to John San Giovanni. Thanks for having me. Thanks Corwin and thanks all of you. Have a good rest of your school year. Take care.